Good afternoon and welcome to uh, the regulator panel. My name is Kieran Raj. I'm the Deputy General Counsel here at the Department of Homeland Security. And I'm very excited to moderate this panel, not only because of the substance, but also we have a great uh, set of panelists. And you all have the bio book, so I don't want to belabor um, the, the bios, but I do want to take a moment to introduce our panelists. So immediately to my right is Stephanie Avakian, who is the Deputy Director of the Division of Enforcement in the United States Securities and Exchange Commission. Stephanie um, has uh, been working at the SEC since 2014, and before that she's a partner, she was a partner at Wilmer Hale. Immediately to Stephanie's right is Lisa Folks, who's the Deputy Bureau Chief of Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau in the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, Lisa is responsible for developing and implementing the FCC's policies in the area of cybersecurity. And directly to her right is Manisha Mithal, who is the Associate Director in the Division of Privacy and Identity Protection in the Federal Trade Commission. In her current role, she's managed significant initiatives, inclu including reports on big data, the Internet of Things, and consumer privacy. So very excited to have all three of you with us today. So I want to start out um, and just level set, maybe start with some basics. I want to ask you all the same question, which is, um, what is the scope of your agency's authority as it relates to cybersecurity practices? And what are the laws, you know, statutes, and regulations that you would specifically point to that gives you that scope? And Stephanie, maybe I'll just start with you. Sure. sure. Um, I mean, for us, I think about it, I, I break it up into two different pieces. I think about it in terms of registered firms, so broker dealers, investment advisors, and the like, and then public companies um, on the other hand. And so in terms of firms, kind of um, broadly speaking, there are a bunch of different regulations, I think, that come into play in this sphere. Things like Reg SP, so our safeguards rule, um, which requires firms to have policies and procedures in place um, that are reasonably designed to protect customer information. Reg SID, which is basically an identity theft um, red flags rule. So really reasonable policies and procedures in place to protect customer, um, the use of customer information or misuse of customer information. Reg SCI is probably our most sweeping and comprehensive regulation in this regard. And it applies to um, certain firms, certain types of market participants. So ATSs, SROs, clearing agencies, and that really requires very comprehensive policies and procedures related to the technology systems. Um, it's got a bunch of different components to it, but in addition to comprehensive policies and procedures, it requires firms to take appropriate corrective action, um, to notify the commission of um, problems, system changes, things like that, to inform their members of incidents, um, requires business continuity testing, um, annual reviews, things like that. There are other regulations that I would say may not necessarily be specific to cybersecurity, but I think of them in that bucket. So our market access rule, which, which requires firms to have policies and procedures in place um, to control, you know, that are reasonably designed to protect the marketplace from uh, improper orders, false orders, things like that. There are other rules that I would say fall into those kinds of areas. But um, as a general matter, I would say, you know, application of the rules is fairly it's broad-based, we think about this, you know, there's no, no sort of one-size-fits-all in terms of how we look at compliance with the rules. Um, it really depends on the firm and on the, the facts and circumstances. And then I would say, like, in the public company sphere, there's no um, specific cyber rule I would point to other than to say there are general disclosure obligations, and our division of corporation finance addressed these in um, guidance that it put out a few years back that specifically talks about when companies should be thinking about um, cyber-related disclosures. So th that's, broadly speaking, that's what we're looking at in terms of a framework. Um, the Federal Communications Commission is the primary uh, federal government agency responsible for regulatory oversight over the communications sector. Now, what does that mean? Um, that means um, oversight over commercial communications networks, telephony, including mobile telephony, broadcast stations, cable television systems, satellite um, networks. 
Uh, it also means public safety communications. As many of you know, a lot of um, first responders, for example, are relying on FCC licensed radios in order to communicate and respond to disasters. Um, we have authority over that. We do not have authority over federal government communication issues. Those are handled by the executive branch, including any spectrum issues um, that may come up. Our authority flows from the Communications Act, which um, gives us uh, authority over all of these uh, sectors, uh, subsectors that I just mentioned. And as part of our directive, we have a fundamental responsibility to promote the safety of life and property through communications policy. Now, with respect to uh, cybersecurity, the commission um, has taken what we call a, life a light touch approach on cybersecurity. FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler likes to call it the new regulatory paradigm. But basically what that means is we believe that industry is in the best position to address cyber vulnerabilities within their networks. And so our focus has been on collaborative efforts, public-private partnerships, as opposed to um, imposing prescriptive regulations saying you must do X or you must do Y. Now, uh, to get into more detail about what this light touch means, and there's essentially about four, four parts. One is facilitating industry to take the lead in developing and implementing dem what we call demonstrably effective security risk management practices and policies. In other words, the industry has, to, we want the industry to assess their risk and own their risk. And so what we are expecting them to do is figure out what their risk is and what security measures, what risk management measures are best for their, for their organization. And we have taken a number of initiatives to facilitate industry um, taking those actions. We also work collaboratively with industry to ensure that cybersecurity principles are baked into new technologies. A lot of times what we have seen when we've seen new technologies is security comes into the discussion as an afterthought. And one of the things that we have said we want to see is what we call security by, it's security by design. And what that means is security is part of the design process when we're coming up with new technologies. In fact, recently, um, the wireless industry has started in their standards development for fifth generation um, wireless technologies. I'm sure a lot of your phones say 4G on them. Well, they're now working on 5G. And the, what the commission has said is security ought to be baked into those standards as opposed to waiting until the standards are up and are already out there being developed and then somebody says, uh-oh, we need to consider security. Uh, so basically, we work closely with industry to try to ensure that as we're moving forward with technological advancements, that security is baked into the process early on. We also work with the Department of Homeland Security and other federal partners and industries to support and facilitate information sharing. For example, the FCC, one of its advisory committees, we have tasked with uh, developing best practices for industry to engage in information, share, information sharing. And lastly, we also are working with our federal partners and the industry to increase the cybersecurity expert bench within the agency as well as um, within, the within the communications sector. So basically, if I were to sum up what our approach is on cybersecurity, it's very much light touch. We want to facilitate and strongly encourage industry to take the lead in addressing this issue within the communications sector. Uh, okay, so I'm Manisha Mithil with the FTC, um, and I would say we enforce three sector-specific uh, laws related to security, uh, as well as a law of general applicability. So um, in terms of se sector-specific, we have our own safeguards rule under the Grand Lynch bliley Act, uh, which applies to financial institutions under our jurisdiction. These are many non-bank financial institutions, such as mortgage companies, tax preparers, debt collectors, credit reporting agencies, and the like. Um, second sector-specific statute is the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, we have a couple of rules that we enforce under the FCRA, including the disposal rule, uh, which requires safe disposal of consumer report information, as well as the red flags rule um, that Stephanie also mentioned. Um, the third sector-specific law is the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which contains specific security requirements 
for websites or online services that collect information from kids under 13. So then we have the catch-all, uh, Section 5 of the FTC Act, which prohibits deceptive or unfair practices. So deceptive practice is fairly obvious. If a company says we use a certain level of encryption and they don't, that would be a deceptive practice under the FTC Act. If a company says that we use uh, the gold standard of security and it doesn't, that could be a deceptive practice under the FTC Act. Um, in terms of unfairness, uh, we have our statute prescribes a three-part test for determining whether a practice is unfair. So it has to either one cause, not either, it has to one cause or be likely to cause substantial consumer injury. Two, that injury cannot be outweighed by the benefits to consumers or competition. And three, the injury can't be reasonably avoidable by consumers. And so what we've done is, under all of these statutes and under the FTC Act, we've essentially boiled down um, the test, the standard, to a reasonableness test. Uh, if it would cost $100 to fix a problem that would, co that would cause a dollar worth of harm, uh, then it's not unreasonable not to do it, and you wouldn't be violating the FTC Act. So it's not a strict liability test. It's not about a breach. It's about whether the company had reasonable security up front. So on the reasonableness test, one of the uh, either criticisms or concerns we heard and when I got there, I talked to the private sector, is, well, what does that mean? Because one person's reasonableness is another person's, you spend way too much money and you shouldn't have done this. And so what are the sort of factors, or if I'm a private sector or a general counsel sitting out there trying to advise my client, how do I think about that? What are the factors that you would look for before taking enforcement action in this space? Uh, sure. So, uh, so we look at a number of factors because we don't believe that there's a one-size-fits-all that's appropriate for every company. So we look at things like the amount and sensitivity of data a company collects, the size and complexity of the network, the availability of low-cost measures to resolve the issue. We also look to see whether the company had a process in place. Um, I think the other panelists have talked a little bit about this. Uh, do you have uh, somebody designated to think about security issues? Have you conducted a risk assessment? Do you have a plan for overseeing service providers? And are, is it, are you looking at it as kind of one and I'm done exercise, or are you constantly reevaluating? So those are the types of things we look at, and we've provided a lot of guidance. Um, all of our cases, complaints, orders are available um, on our website. We've issued a recent piece called Start With Security that basically distills the lessons from our dozens of security cases. Uh, and we have a number of sector-specific advice. So for example, um, we have some advice for um, IoT companies on how to maintain reasonable security. So through guidance, um, through cases, through closing letters, through blog posts, we try to put meat on the bones of what is reasonableness. And Stephanie, same question to you. And, and I wonder if you could talk through also the extent there are you know, lessons you've learned from your uh, enforcement actions in this space or other things that you've thought about doing uh, in the division enforcement. What are the factors and what are the lessons that companies should be thinking about? Well, I guess, I mean, again, I think about these in different buckets, right? Because we've got registrants and we have public companies. So in the public company sp sphere, in terms of disclosure and what you've said to folks, I would echo a lot of what Manisha said, um, but if you, you know, when I think about enforcement broadly from the SEC's perspective, how are we thinking about cyber cases, I really put, in, put the types of cases into three buckets, and I think that's how you have to sort of evaluate the cases depending on where they fall within there. So the first bucket I would call, you know, those violations by broker dealers, investment advisors, but registered firms for not having the policies and procedures in place that they need to have. We've brought a handful of those cases. Um, the second bucket, I would say, are really those ones where there's been some sort of hack or other criminal activity um, into a system that has resulted in the theft of non-public information, material non-public information, that's used in some way in the marketplace. So stealing material non-public information in order to trade on it, stealing in order to manipulate, stealing in order to trade against it, those kinds of things. Um, and then the last category, I would say, and we've brought some cases in that space, um, so in one very high profile hacking case just over a year ago. Um, and then the third category, I would say, would really be that public company, you know, disclosure case. Um, was there disclosure made that was false? Was there disclosure not made? We've not brought a case in this third bucket yet. Um, could I envision one that we would bring? Sure. Um, but it would have to be, you know, a fairly significant disclosure failure, and it would have to be obviously material. So those are the three that I think about when, when you come back to that first category and say, you know, what are the factors that you're considering? I mean, it's like any other case that we're evaluating. Look, I recognize 
um, you know, that we're looking at these in hindsight to the extent there's been a breach, right? There doesn't always need to be a breach for us to um, dig into these sorts of cases and look at the issues. But the cases we've brought so far, the Reg SP cases we brought, we brought one maybe two months ago or so, the Morgan Stanley case, and then we brought one against R.T. Jones roughly a year and a half ago or so. And I think when you read the orders, you can see the kinds of things that we're looking at. But it's, you know, in the R.T. Jones case, it was really a failure to have any real policies and procedures that addressed cyber, you know, potential cyber incidents, and there were a lot of failures in there. In the Morgan Stanley case, there was an access issue, you know, where people were able to access accounts for a period of like 10 years that they had no legitimate business need to access. So I think the ones we've brought show pretty starkly some of the issues that we think are critical. Um, you know, there's also our OC, um, Office of Compliance Inspections and Examinations, obviously does exams in this space. They've done a lot of exams. They've been publishing, um, they've published two um, risk alerts on the types of things they're finding in the context of exams. And so looking back at that sort of information, all of which is on our website, is also a pretty good indication of where they view the higher risk areas and the problematic issues. So on the disclosure uh, point, you know, one of the questions that um, we seem to hear a lot too is, do I need to disclose a breach? And if I do, how big does the breach have to be? So is there any guidance you can give in that space uh, to some of our if private only sector? I, if only I had the silver bullet on that <laughs> one, right? Actually, before I before I go any further, I totally forgot to give my disclaimer, which is that you know anything. My remarks today don't necessarily they're my own. Don't necessarily reflect the views of the commission or the commission staff. Before I answer this question, um, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, look. Like I said, our Division of Corporation Finance put out guidance back in 2011 that I think gives a rough sense of the types of um, the types of disclosures companies should be thinking about. It's always going to be a facts and circumstances scenario, right? Materiality is obviously the guidepost. If something's material, it's got to be disclosed. You know, we do recognize that, particularly in the wake of a breach. The facts change very rapidly, what's known and when it's known and whether the information you have is right or wrong or turns out to be wrong. We know that's a moving target. I think we appreciate that and that's, I think that appreciation is reflected in how we look at these issues. Um, like I said, we've not brought a case in that space yet. Can I envision one? Absolutely. It would have to be a pretty significant disclosure failure um, in that regard. But but those are you know the kinds of things we're looking at are you know, what did you disclose in your risk factors? What did you disclose in your MDNA? When did you know something? When did you disclose about it? But really it's a question of, you know, we're not looking to second guess good faith decisions and good faith disclosure. Lisa, um, from the FCC's perspective, I know there's been rulemaking um, in this area in terms of breach notification. Maybe you could just give the audience a little bit of an overview of that and the current status and, and just what's the idea behind that from the FCC's perspectives? Okay, um, the proceeding that you're referring to, we call it the privacy proceeding because it actually is broader than just data security, data breach. The main, it also talks about, deals with transparency and uh, giving consumers choices in how they can protect their information. So there's a number of issues tied up in that proceeding. Um, the commission issued the notice of proposed rulemaking earlier this year. The comment period has closed. And so the staff is, working uh, very hard going through all those comments. They continue to meet with uh, stakeholders, both in industry as well as um, our federal partners on the issues. And so, um, I mean, at this time, I can't say when um, a, a, any action will be taken, but they are working very hard on that proceeding. Um, Manisha, you know, one of the things we see at DHS is just the evolving landscape of technology and the cyber threats. And I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit about how the evolution of the cyber threat landscape has changed uh, or perhaps refocused some of the enforcement priorities from the perspective of the FTC. Uh, sure, so, so I would say in terms of security, um, uh, let me just mention three main priorities. Um, uh, the first is IoT. Um, so connected devices and IoT is what I would put in that bucket. Uh, that's something that, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of stories about um, security shortcomings in IoT devices. Um, we brought a case a few years ago uh, uh, involving a company that was manufacturing internet-connected cameras. 
where people actually found the live feeds of their bedrooms up on the internet um, as a result of a hack, and we alleged the company um, hadn't maintained reasonable security. Um, more recently, we uh, took action against uh, Asus, uh, which manufactured routers, and we alleged that they failed to appropriately test the routers before they put them out in the marketplace. So IoT is one. Um, second is health. Um, so I think we've seen a lot of reports that data breaches, uh, security issues, ransomware are uh, disproportionately affecting the health sector. Um, and so we brought a lot of recent cases involving health. Just as an example, um, we uh, had a case against a company called GMR that was transcribing doctor's notes. Um, and they were outsourcing the transcription service to a company in India. And we alleged that they didn't do enough to make sure that their service provider in India was protecting the information. And as a result, people found psychiatrist notes um, on the internet. Um, so that's health. And then the third priority, I would say, is um, uh, basically the mobile ecosystem. Um, so we brought a case uh, a couple years ago against um, HTC, where we alleged that uh, HTC failed to um, appropriately uh, test and secure its devices. Um, more recently, we brought cases against uh, Credit Karma and Fandango, mobile apps that uh, didn't uh, implement encryption properly. Um, so, so those are the main priorities. But I would say that you know, even as new technologies come online and new issues come online, I think one of the reasons why we have not provided any sort of checklist of data security is that whether it's IoT or a retailer um, or a software company, um, we think that the principles are the same to have a process-based approach where you do a risk assessment, you oversee your service providers, you train your employees. Um, and so, um, so I think that translates regardless of the technology. Um, and Stephanie, what about you? I mean, again, back to your different buckets of enforcement, um, the types of enforcement. Do you see priorities sort of among them or within them, or how would you how would you um, discuss yeah. that? Yeah, it's sort of it's sort of hard to say in some ways, right? Because obviously, protecting customer information, and all that that that's clearly a priority, and that's really something we hope to not have to get into in the enforcement space that often, right? We hope that our OC folks are out there identifying stuff through examinations, that firms are dealing with this stuff proactively. We do do the enforcement cases um, when we have to and we'll continue to do them, but hopefully um, our Office of Compliance Inspections and Examinations is really working with firms um, and helping them in that regard and focus on the right issues. Where I would say we see the most activity right now um, in terms of our own investigative docket and the, the concerns that are out there is probably this space of hacking in order to take advantage of some sort of market information. I mean, that's where we're seeing a lot more, you know, hacking into accounts in order to trade against, you know, tr trade on the other side of them, um, you know, unauthorized access into accounts. We brought a case, um, the Mustafa case, a couple of months ago with that sort of fact pattern. Um, the, ha the big hacking case we brought not this past August, the one before, um, which involved, you know, we, we sued over 30 people um, in various countries for hacking into um, various newswire companies before news releases were put out and trading on the information. And that was a massive, intricate insider trading scheme. Um, and we're seeing more of that kind of activity. So I would say that's kind of the most concerning um, among the issues, or at least the most prolific that, in terms of what we're seeing. So one of the themes earlier in the day, especially for the panel that talked about um, Presidential Policy Directive 41, which is the increase in coordination in the federal government in response to a significant cyber incident. I wonder, um, you know, start with you again, Stephanie, to um, talk a little bit about the coordination you have either with other regulatory agencies or other executive branch agencies when you're thinking about moving forward uh, in terms of an enforcement action. Yeah, in the enforcement space, um, we do coordinate with others really just as we do in any kind of case. We do a lot of work with um, the FBI, with the criminal folks, um, you know, certainly the hacking case again, with Secret Service, FBI, um, DOJ, different U.S. attorney's offices, so lots of folks there. But separate and apart from the enforcement cases, because a lot of these do really have a criminal component and we work closely with the, the criminal authorities and the FBI in them. We also spend a lot of time um, as an enforcement division and as an agency coordinating with other agencies and with law enforcement. And so in the Division of Enforcement, we've been spending a lot of time um, working with folks at DOJ, FBI, Secret Service, and others to really try to get in front of this problem as much as we can, both case-specific as well as, I would say, broadly in terms of 
focusing on what the issues are um, and trying to address them where we can head on. And then as an agency, um, certainly we've been very active, for example, in the FIBIC, in um, these other organizations, uh, you know, trying to think about um, potential uh, market impact and how to handle things, you know, to the extent there are problems, um, breaches, market incidents, things like that. We as a government are all working together to try to address those concerns and those issues and be ready for stuff as it happens. Anisha, uh, sort of same question to you from the FTC's perspective. Sure, and, and I think, you know, I, I didn't mention at the outset, you know, we really do have jurisdiction over a broad range of sectors of the economy. We have certain exclusions. We don't have jurisdiction over banks and common carriers and nonprofits and a couple other small carve-outs. But we really do cover a wide swath of the economy. Um, and so really we have had to coordinate with regulators in a number of spaces, whether it's HHS for Health or Department of Education for Kids or um, FCC involving telecoms, CFPB involving financial. Um, and so we, ha we have you know, bilateral contacts with all of these agencies. Um, and we try to leverage our resources and our cooperation. I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, you know, a lot of mobile health apps um, often wonder, well, who's my regulator? Am I covered by HHS? What am I supposed to do? Um, and so we worked with HHS and FDA to develop this uh, business education, I would call it a wizard, where you can kind of answer a bunch of questions and determine, well, okay, am I regulated you know, under the FTC Act or by HIPAA? So, so I think that was a very positive example of um, uh, interagency cooperation. Um, another example is actually with the FCC. Um, you know, one, one of the things that we were seeing in the marketplace is that uh, we felt that um, mobile devices were slow to get updates. Um, and so we said, okay, is this a problem with the OEMs? Is it a problem with the platforms, the operating systems, or is it a problem with the carriers? And so we're working on a project with the FCC where they're asking questions of the carriers, which are in their, in their jurisdiction, and we're asking questions of the platforms and the OEMs to say, okay, well, how does the security update process work? Um, so, so in terms of those kinds of um, collaborations, I think they're happening all the time. Um, in terms of the criminal authorities, I think we've also tried to provide guidance to companies and work with criminal authorities. So uh, just a couple of examples there. Um, uh, we issued a blog post uh, talking about the idea of uh, cooperation with the criminal authorities. And we've said, certainly if uh, companies are cooperating with criminal authorities, that would be a plus factor in determining whether we would bring an enforcement action against that company. Um, more recently, we issued a, a post about um, how the FTC Act maps onto the NIST framework, and we talked about how the two are very consistent, and we go through a bunch of examples from our cases about things that you could find that are both in our cases and in the um, NIST guidance. So it, the coordination is happening constantly. So I'm glad you brought up NIST because it sort of um, goes into the, my next sort of uh, number of questions about best practices. All right, so if you, you've alluded to um, a few, of, a few of you alluded to best practices and what should companies should do. And so if I am, for example, an entity that's regulated by the FCC, are there best practices out there that I should be following? How did you, um, you know, come up with them? Was it a, you know, the government, the FCC doing it by itself? Was it a collaboration with private sector? Just background on that for, for the audience. This is a really good example where we collaborate with industry and other stakeholders. The FCC itself does not develop best practices. Um, the approach that we have taken, and we've done this not just in cybersecurity, but in the whole area of communications reliability, is we task our federal advisory committees to recommend best practices and other solutions to whether it's security or reliability problems. So for example, um, back in 2004, back when the uh, NIST framework came out, we t tasked our primary advisory committee the Communications Security, Reliability, and Interoperability Council, that's a mouthful, I'll just say CISRIC, um, to develop recommendations for how the communications sector could implement security risk management practices, um, using the NIST framework as an example. And what the CISRIC did was, it didn't just come up with one big guidance of um, best practices that are supposed to apply to all, what they did was they took the NIST framework, they had about 100 people involved, and they developed recommended best practices for each of the major five sectors of the communications industry 
and included not only um, best practices that would apply to the larger companies, but the ones that would apply to smaller companies. Um, we've done the same thing with 911 call centers. One of the things that we've been pushing is for public safety agencies to th themselves start thinking about how to respond to cyber to cyber vulnerabilities and to start thinking about, okay, how do I assess risk? How do I um, do security risk management? And so we have a separate advisory committee which we have tasked with looking at that issue and coming up with recommendations that could be used by the nation's uh, 911 call centers. And so when I talk about um, the light touch approach that the FCC uses, a key part of that is the collaborative process through these federal advisory committees. So some of the entities, and some of them are probably represented in this room, are regulated by more than one agency. Right? They fit into a number of different buckets. And one of the sort of concerns or criticisms that's been raised is there are so many best practices out there. Do I do the NIST framework? Do I do some of the best practices that other agencies put forward? So how do you um, respond to some of those questions that are coming from the private sector, which is, which best practices do I follow? I can't follow them all. What the FCC has said to the communications sector is, the best practices aren't, the intent is not that you follow them all. The intent is that, again, we want the industry to own the risk. So we expect the industry to look at the various best practices and the way we have it set up um, on our FCC website is that a company can go and put in some keywords and come up with, uh, and, and they, the system will give them a bunch of uh, best practices that they can take a look at. But what we say to them is, no, you, we're not telling you to um, try to implement all of them because all of them are not going to apply to your particular organization figure out which ones apply to your organization and then decide whether you're going to implement those. So it's not designed to be this onerous, pull your hair out, oh my gosh, there's a hundred different, different ones. I, I, do I have to apply all of them? We want you to figure out which ones make sense for your organization and, and then go on ahead and apply those as you see fit. Anisha, how about, how about you? I mean, it's interesting. I think I more often hear the opposite issue that, you know, why aren't you providing more guidance? Um, and so, um, uh, I mean, I do think we've provided a lot of guidance, and I mentioned and alluded to some of those um, that appear on our website. But, um, but I would agree with Lisa. I mean, I think that, you know, each company has to determine based on, again, the amount and sensitivity of data they collect, their business, um, you know, the availability of low-cost measures. They have to, you know, have their own um, experts if they're going to collect personal data. Um, sensitive personal data about consumers, um, and I think they have to, um, you know, use what's out there and kind of tailor it to their own business circumstance. And what about training? Is there any expectation um, from your perspective of companies making sure to train their employees on best practices or cybersecurity practices? Is that something that you sort of recommend as part of your best practices and things that you look for as you're looking at, you know, how, how seriously a company is taking their cybersecurity practices? Uh, yeah, I absolutely think employee training is an important component um, because, after all, if you have just a paper exercise, if you have policies sitting in a file drawer, uh, that's not going to do much for uh, security. So I think employee training is a very crucial part of best practices. Thanks. Uh, I would agree with that. Um, and one of the things that we have said to the communications sector and public, and public safety agencies that... Uh, are operating on FCC licensed communications is that your training can't just be for the folks that are in the IT department or the station engineer. It really needs to be all your employees. Now, depending on what their role is, the training may be different. But for example, um, your employees should have some inf training on basic uh, security protocols, um, putting up firewalls um, between your con for your connections with the internet. Um, knowing that you need to change your default password, uh, knowing that you sh maybe should not put your default password in the owner's manual and then put the owner's manual on the internet. And, and yes, somebody uh, that we deal with actually did that. Um, so so um, we, we, we have strongly encouraged 
companies and pub in the public safety community to make sure that at least all of their employees have some type of basic um, knowledge of security protocols and certainly as um, depending on different roles within the organization, um, they may need more. The other thing that we've tried to emphasize both overall and in training is that um, there needs to be understanding about cybersecurity risks, some understanding at all levels of an organization. As I said, it can't just be, oh, that's the IT's problem, or that's the station engineer's problem, and the station engineer thinks that cyber can be addressed by putting tape in the USB ports. Yes, there was somebody that we dealt with that actually thought that. Um, it has to be all the way up to the senior executive, the C-suite level. If you're a mom and pop in, in the communication sector, we've got mom and pops owning broadcast stations that support the presidential emergency alert system. They need to have some um, training, some understanding of the cyber risk and security protocols for their organization. And so, um, you know, how does um, some of the best practices that you put together with the private sector, how does it relate to, for example, I mean, not to bring it back to DHS, but, uh, you know, we talked a lot about indicator sharing earlier today as something that companies can do to, you know, uh, better protect themselves and their networks and also perhaps their vendors and, and other third parties. Is that something you look at, whether a company is participating in one of those, uh, you know, sort of government offered services as, you, as you're sort of thinking through whether they have adequate cybersecurity protection? I start with you, Manisha. Uh, sure, yes, it's, it's absolutely something we look at, and we've supported the creation of ISACs um, for a long time now, and we've supported it not just with words and our bully pulpit, but we've also worked with DOJ to provide antitrust exemptions. So, um, so we think that's a very important component. I, I would say that, you know, you know, a lot of times people want to hear kind of the black and white answers, but unfortunately it's not really black and white. So I, I wouldn't view membership as an, in an ISAC as kind of a get out of jail free card for abysmal security, but I definitely look at it as a, a plus factor. Um, Stephanie, going back to, you know, your point earlier that some of the, the cases you're seeing more release your priorities are focused on those where folks are stealing data to potentially manipulate or, you know, trade on material non-public information. What are some of the red flags in those cases that you might have seen beforehand that the companies should have been looking at? Uh, and, you know, what lessons have, have folks learned from that? And have that been incorporated back into some of your best practices or other guidance? That's a, that's an interesting question. It's hard for me to set, to look at specific cases and identify red flags, I think, in advance in these sort of market manipulation and theft cases. Um, in the, what I would call like the Reg SP cases and the failure to have policies and procedures, that's a little different, right? Because those are risks, either you're not testing, so you don't know, or you're not training, and so therefore things are happening that shouldn't be happening. But when I think about those market manipulation cases and those kinds of theft cases, those are much harder ones. Um, and you look at the, the companies that they're stealing the information from and the like. I mean, I think it really does go back to sort of your best practices. First of all, I think we recognize that, that this is not always preventable, right? So, so with that, it's kind of the outset. You could have all the best practices and still be penetrated and still have information stolen. But I think going back to what Lisa and Manisha have said, you know, one of the most critical things is that this is uh, a risk that is fully appreciated and embraced by the most senior management. It's not an IT risk. So it's really about knowing for each company, where are your most precious assets, where are your crown jewels, and how are they protected? Um, and focusing sort of from there outwards, whether it's, you know, a combination of training, policies and procedures, firewalls, and other um, technological um, protections. I think those are all the areas folks need to be looking at. I would say when I think back to kind of more SEC enforcement specific, if I think about um, disclosure issues and the like, that also is relevant in this kind of C-suite conversation and who knows what the risks are. And you know, when you're talking about disclosure both in advance of a breach, so disclosure about your cyber controls, for instance, or the risk that a cyber incident poses to your company, or if you're in the wake of a breach and, and trying to make disclosure decisions, it's critical that firms follow, it, well, that they have, and that they follow their regular disclosure control procedures. Um, that the right people are in the room talking about these issues, that there's a mix of folks who understand the IT side with the folks who understand the business risks, with disclosure counsel, with whoever's doing your 
controls work, with your auditor perhaps, um, and with others. But I think it's critical that folks have um, all the same, you know, disclosures and disclosure controls in place, audit committee involvement, all those things, because that's all going to be stuff that we look at, you know, when you're, when you come, bring it back to the enforcement side and we're looking at it with the benefit of hindsight, those are all the sorts of things we're going to be looking at. I should, there is one thing, Manisha made me think of it that I do want to, um, I think it's important to, um, to uh, note, we also have, have been publicly saying, and I think it's worth reiterating, that we think it's absolutely critical that um, registrants and public companies, so registered firms and public companies, in the wake of a breach, report to law enforcement. That is absolutely critical. And so there may or may not, you know, you, you have to work through your disclosure issues, you've got to work through um, other reporting issues. But reporting to appropriate law enforcement, whether that's FBI, whether it's DHS, whoever it is, is probably the most critical things folks need to do quickly. And that is something, you know, if down the road there is an enforcement action by the SEC, that is something we will take into account as a very significant factor in terms of cooperation. Um, and so I, I thought it was worth piggybacking on what Manisha said in that regard. Well, I know um, we're probably going to have some questions for the panel for the audience. So let me. Um, turn to the audience, and if someone has a question, raise your hand, we'll, we'll send a mic over. Also, if you've written a question down on your note card, just uh, lift up your note card, and we'll have someone come around and grab it. So, questions? Yeah, someone right here. Yeah. Thanks. I, I know uh, a couple of you made reference to the fact that you get a lot of valuable information from your examination teams and what they're bringing back to you so you can kind of keep an eye on what to look at. I was wondering if you could share with us some of, uh, whether it comes through training or through recruiting, the work that you do to make sure that those exam teams have the technical acumen when they come in and look at things, have that understanding that, for example, the NIST framework is not supposed to be this huge checklist that everybody has to comply with every piece. You know, the kind of preparation that's done for those people in this environment where things are changing constantly and moving around. Yeah, I, um, our folks in our OC group are spending a lot of time getting educated on these issues, thinking about these issues. Um, unfortunately, I'm not close enough to sort of be able to answer with any particularity kind of what they're doing. I wish I could. Um, but they are spending a lot of time um, training on these issues. They've put together um, a, uh, a group. It's called our TCP group, and that's the group that gets the daily reports on the Reg SCI entities and considers, you know, what the issues are there, whether there are issues of concern. So they are, um, I know that they're very, uh, that they are um, well trained in this area, and um, until recently, Chris Hetner was part of that group. He used to be the CISO at GE Capital. He's now um, been put into a new position, which is senior advisor to the chair on cyber committee on cybersecurity. So we've got a fair amount of expertise, but I can't. I, I don't know the real sort of intricacies of the training, so I apologize. Yeah, I, I didn't want to answer the question because, well, I, I didn't want to start because we don't have examination authority at the FTC. Um, so we um, get our information through administrative subpoenas of companies and third parties. Um, but, you know, I, your question is a well taken one because, you know, a lot of us are lawyers and, um, you know, our technical expertise is, is, um, is not necessarily keeping pace with the private sector. And so we've done a few things to try to shore that up. So first of all, we have um, hired a lot of in-house technical expertise. We've created an office of technology research and investigations, um, and they do a lot of security research. We have a chief technologist at the FTC, and so we really try to shore up the in-house technical expertise. Um, second, um, in all of our investigations, or many of our investigations, we hire outside consultants, so outside security experts to evaluate um, security issues. Um, and third, oh, third, what I was gonna say is that we, um, we've also tried to build ties with security researchers outside of government. So uh, we host an annual event called PrivacyCon where we call on companies to report security vulnerabilities. We talk, you know, white hat hackers, privacy specialists, researchers, disclosure specialists. Um, and we try to kind of compile that research so that we are be better educated on the types of things that are happening in the marketplace. 
Um, with respect to the FCC, we also don't use examiners, but we have a division, the Cybersecurity and Communications Reliability Division, where we have increased that cybersecurity expertise bench and hired a number of uh, technical experts with cybersecurity um, um, expertise. Our chief technologist has a lot of expertise, for the agency has a lot of expertise with uh, cybersecurity. Uh, the bureau, the, my bureau, Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, has itself um, hired a chief technologist with cyber expertise. Um, like many agencies, we too are made up of a bunch of know-it-all lawyers. Um, I will be probably be kicked out of the lawyers club for saying that. Um, but um, one of the things that my boss who has done, who is, and he is not a lawyer, is send a lot of us to um, training to increase our knowledge on cybersecurity. And I'm an example of that. I'm his deputy, and um, he has sent me to the National Defense University I College, and I'm actually taking a course, uh, my second course uh, this semester um, at NDU. So, and we've also done training at, uh, through the Department of Homeland Security and through Commerce. I think we have another question. Uh, Karen, if I may. Uh, first, uh, thanks, Karen, for pulling this together. Uh, it, it was probably a lot of work to uh, pull it all together so um, effectively. Thank you. And thanks to your panels. Uh, Matthew Eggers, by the way, with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. So we're um, very active in encouraging members to use the framework, have a plan, improve their plan, and uh, use CISA and AIS as, as appropriate. Um, one thing that comes up um, time and time again, and in the context of this meeting, and um, in the context of regulations is the CISA law says that regulators can't use, uh, let's say, indicators directly for regulatory purposes, but uh, indirect action might be a different matter. What's the approach that you all talk about in terms of interfacing with, let's say, DHS, the receipt of uh, indicators and so forth? How are you going to approach that in the context of being regulated? Thank you. Um, so, so you know, I, I think maybe it would be helpful to, um, I think sometimes the terminology we use at the FTC may be a little bit different from the terminology that's used when people are talking about DHS or um, criminal uh, law enforcement. Um, so, you know, we don't, ha we don't have a cyber program. We don't have a breach program. Our program is focused on consumer security, securing customer information, securing personal information. So we are not as focused on kind of IP or confidential business information, um, you know, or even kind of um, the cyber terrorism, you know, threats. Um, we're mostly focused on, you know, our SSNs compromised or, uh, you know, consumer um, health information compromised, um, or is there a danger that it will be compromised? So from that perspective, I think our missions are somewhat different. Um, you know, that being said, you know, of course we coordinate with these agencies. We um, have, you know, shared our start with security materials. We've done joint um, education of, of companies. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to, you know, be consistent um, and provide companies with the guidance they need. But I, would, I will say our focuses are somewhat different. <laughs> No, not uh, other than um, what Manisha said in the sense that we do coordinate, as I said, at a large scale, um, really thinking about strategies um, for going after these problems and the like. But to the extent we're talking about specifics and specific cases, those are really limited to where we've got parallel investigations and are doing work together. Other questions? Um, a question for Stephanie. Uh, with regard to the question about disclosing the material cyber event. Uh, to what extent is it a concern that hackers could actually manipulate um, stocks by hacking into a company in a way that was very embarrassing and might, might cause uh, a notifiable event, which in turn could help the stock price? And is that a factor that you would take into account in looking at whether uh, an event really was material, whether notice really was desirable. It's, this is something that's just bothered me for several I years. I think it's, you know, all part of the facts and circumstances mix. I've gotten questions similar to that before, very hard to answer in the abstract, right? Um, and those are the kinds of things I think folks should 
also, you know, when you're when you're in the moment and trying to make decisions about disclosure, reach out to our division of corporation finance and talk through some of these issues. Great, thanks. Other questions? Um, we did have one question that was on a note card um, that I think you've covered a little bit, Stephanie, but I'll, I'll ask it perhaps a little bit slightly differently, which is, you know, sometimes companies make disclosures that at a later time turns out that they might have known more than they actually did. And, you know, how is that something of concern to you as you look at it from an enforcement perspective? And, um, you know, how significant of a concern is that? Yeah, I mean, look, to the extent the issues that are known and aren't disclosed are material, obviously a factor, right? I mean, it, again, it goes to the total mix. Investors are entitled to accurate, timely disclosure, um, you know, the information that a reasonable investor would want to know. So those are, I mean, that's the most basic test. Um, the Corp Fin guidance, I think, addresses this, uh, this stuff, but again, you know, to the extent um, disclosures are made, you know, using your regular disclosure process and made in good faith, um, and folks make good faith decisions, we're not looking to second guess those. Um, but to the extent there are, you know, misleading statements, misleading material omissions and those sorts of things, that's of course gonna be concerning. And is most of the, the focus, I mean, we, we talked a little bit about the rulemaking, the FCC rulemaking, but is most of your focus at this point just putting out guidance as opposed to potentially doing either rulemaking rule or in some cases um, just adjudications to, especially when we talk about the standard of care, when we start with that, what does reasonableness really mean? And, and so I'm curious, is that, you know, is that the sort of approach, for example, from the FTC perspective, focus on guidance and, you know, if you have to bring a case, you bring a case. Um, so uh, we don't have APA rulemaking authority under Section 5 of the FTC Act. Um, so we have a very arcane form of rulemaking called Magnuson Moss rulemaking, um, which involves public hearings and cross-examinations by anybody. And uh, I think the last one we did was in the 70s, and it took 10 years. So not very well suited for a, uh, a changing technological environment. Um, and so instead of using rulemaking, we have um, used case-by-case -case, uh, adjudication, um, and we've provided guidance. Um, so, um, and so, we, so I think that's, um, our hands are tied in terms of rulemaking to some extent. What about from the FCC's perspective? Um, our main focus on cybersecurity is the public-private uh, partnerships collaborative process and having um, industry and other stakeholders put out the guidance um, through our advisory committees on best practices and other solutions for cyber for cybersecurity vulnerabilities. And, uh, you know, we've mentioned the privacy rulemaking, and I know some people may say, well, wait a minute, that's a rulemaking, but you said you guys don't do prescriptive rules, so wait a minute. The reason why that is the exception to what I have been saying is because um, this particular rulemaking is updating rules that have been on the books for several years, and the rules have been on the books for several years because Congress said so. In other words, Congress, um, as part of the Communications Act, said it put imposed um, a consumer protection, in, a consumer protection of consumer personal information requirement on certain types of telecom of uh, communication service providers, and then said FCC, you need to go administer it. So that is why. That is sort of a carve out to what I've generally been saying has been our cybersecurity uh, strategy. What about you, Stephanie? Um, you know, we we rolled out Reg SCI in the last um, 18 months or so. So obviously that was a huge rulemaking. Um, and I'm not aware of any plans to do other rulemaking. So far um, in more recent times, it's really been through the issuance of guidance primarily through um, OC, through their risk alerts, through their exam program, other guidance, you know, our Division of Investment Management actually um, issued guidance about a year or so ago. So that that's primarily the place. And then obviously the enforcement actions have their own um, messages with them. Any other questions from folks in the audience? No? Oh wait, sorry, one question. The late breaking question over here. Yeah. Um, I was wondering on, with the uh, roll, roll out of the CISA 2015, how has that affected your enforcement policies? I mean, our enforcement policy, I think, has basically maintained, you know, stayed the same. Um, 
broadly speaking, because I don't even want to bring it, you know, into directly into cyber. I would say in the cyberspace, though, the way I've explained that we've been thinking about it with the three buckets, it's essentially stayed the same. Same for the FTC. Uh, any other questions? No? Great. Well, thank you so much for, for uh, doing this panel.